Uh, just an omission of information. And, uh, once again, thank you all for the invitation. So in 20 minutes, I'm going to very briefly give an overview of liver disease and thalassemia, and I'm going to try and emphasize the aspects that are related to the liver rather than to the hematology, as I think uh, both for healthcare professionals on the webcam as well as for patients, you will be very familiar with the management of uh, iron in thalassemia. So I'll rather gloss over those aspects. I also am impressed by the very comprehensive guidelines that have been produced for the management of transfusion dependent thalassemia. And these also, of course, cover liver disease and thalassemia. And I won't emphasize aspects of the guidelines that are very familiar to hematologists, uh, thalassemia specialists who actually see a lot of patients with thalassemia and whose day-to-day -day management is um, very wise and experienced. So to summarize, thalassemia and liver disease is important. It's important because we have perhaps an older population of individuals with both transfusion dependent and non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. It's a complex picture. It relates uh, to multiple blood transfusions in those who are transfusion dependent from an early age. In a past era, chronic viral hepatitis was an important aspect. This is still important in some areas of the world, but fortunately the prevalence is decreasing and we have measures to intervene, and this will be discussed by Dr. Koskinas later. Of course, iron deposition and increased iron absorption are crucial aspects of the liver disease. The cause of the uh, liver disease, therefore, are iron overload, the complex biology of iron overload, the major chronic hepatitis viruses, which are hepatitis C and B, and will be discussed later. I think increasingly in some societies we will see NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis in patients with the metabolic syndrome, which can be induced by thalassemia and also seen in people who might be overweight and have diabetes mellitus. And in occasional cases, we will see alcohol. All of these factors may act together. I won't have a great deal of time to talk about sickle cell hepatopathy, but it is important. It is a complex disease with many manifestations, but I'll probably focus on the iron overload today in the sickle cell hepatopathy. So again, this is bread and butter, and I don't want to emphasize what is written in the extensive and well-written guidelines for thalassemia. We need to diagnose iron overload, and you know that better than I do because of its complex effects on the liver that are not fully understood, but it is injurious and damaging to the liver. And we also need a means to diagnose hepatic fibrosis. We used to rely a lot on liver biopsy. This would give us um, a, a, an extensive uh, picture of the necroinflammatory change in the liver, as well as the amount of fibrosis, and of course was a standard means of measuring liver iron by atomic absorption spectrometry. All of us, I think, use liver biopsy, even in other liver diseases, such as viral hepatitis, much less than previously because of its invasive nature. The literature is replete with extensive correlations between serum ferritin and the uh, liver iron content measured by magnetic resonance imaging. And as you know, there are several excellent MR imaging techniques which have been developed for non-invasive iron quantitation. And these again, extensively used by individuals who, though, who care for patients for thalassemia on a day-to-day -day basis. There are some very sophisticated um, uh, superconductive quantum interference devices, but I understand that these would not be widespread in many parts of the world and certainly not in resource constrained areas of the world. As hepatologists, we rely a lot on transient elastography and the use of transient elastography or the fiber scan for measuring liver stiffness has earned a place in the management of viral hepatitis B and C with quite well worked out parameters for assessing fibrosis and indications for treatment. There is some data in thalassemia, which I'll briefly allude to. Some of us have access to two-dimensional shear wave elastography, also known as ARFI, slightly different technique where the shear wave is delivered by an ultrasound probe. And then, of course, there is the non-invasive diagnostic scores of fibrosis, the most common being APRI and FIB4. But I personally have serious reservations about uh, widespread use of these scores. 
Unfortunately, these become necessary again in resource constrained areas of the world where access to modalities such as fibrous scan is less common. So liver biopsy is no longer necessary to ascertain iron overload. Obviously, it was a very useful technique for understanding the pathology of many liver diseases, including those associated with iron overload. But MRI has fortunately reduced the place of liver biopsy. As you know, because this is your bread and butter on a day to day basis, you will quantitate liver iron, and this is important to do by selected modalities of magnetic resonance imaging. There are a number of excellent reviews that uh, are available which have demonstrated the utility of a T2 star weighting, for example, and quantitation of liver iron overload. And this is clearly important in both assessing the impact of iron chelation, progressive nature of the disease, and almost certainly um, this should be combined with surveillance in selected individuals for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is fundamental to both assessing iron overload as well as hepatic uh, pathology and sometimes architecture. The mainstay of non-invasive assessment of fibrosis for hepatologists has been transient elastography, and this is a useful technique. It's non-invasive. It is painless. Uh, patients will only feel a, a, a slight uh, thud against the skin, and many of the patients who uh, will be listening to this will in fact have had transient elastography and fibroscone measurements. There is some data and publish papers on the use of transient elastography in patients with thalassemia. This, for example, is a study which looked at the um, transient elastography scores in kilopascals in thalassemic patients compared to controls. And you can see that the fibro scan scores here, 5.5, were higher than healthy controls with a median of four. These are to some extent higher in patients who had chronic hepatitis C uh, in this cohort, and we know that there are some gender differences. There is an extensive literature on the use of transient elastography in chronic hepatitis, not quite as extensive in patients with thalassemia, but the available data suggests that this is a reasonable means of assessing hepatic fibrosis. This, for example, is an algorithm that we would use in hepatitis B, where there's a lot of data that is assessed liver stiffness by transient elastography in patients with normal or elevated ALT. And I show this slide not because this is a well worked out parameter for thalassemia, but it does illustrate that at the upper and lower bounds of elastography, we have a very good means of eliminating hepatic fibrosis and advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, from minimal fibrosis. So a low score, typically in hepatitis B, less than six, informs us that we have no significant fibrosis and we can follow up the patients. Whereas if we have a score of nine in hepatitis B, this would indicate severe fibrosis and cirrhosis, and we take this into account. That's not what we're, I'm discussing today, but I would suggest that we can extrapolate values like this in transient elastography for the patients with thalassemia to equally estimate individuals who have minimal fibrosis and those who have advancing fibrosis. And this would seem to be independent of the iron content of the liver. There are some caveats in overweight individuals, we can get false reading. And in patients who have markedly elevated ALT, the readings are distorted and we have to use different cutoffs, but this is not generally a problem in patients with thalassemic, and thus we can extrapolate this technique to patients with thalassemia. Again, I don't want to dwell on management of liver iron. This is uh, very well understood by hematologists looking after patients with uh, thalassemia and well summarized in the published guidelines, but we can use, in fact, uh, dynamics of ferritin, etc. So, so the dynamics of ferritin concentrations, high serum ferritin concentrations with particular cutoffs. For some reason I've lost my screen. I don't know if it's lost from yours. 
we, we lost the presentation. Yes, can you please uh, upload it again? I have no idea what happened, but I'm going to upload it again. I beg your pardon, technical issue. Yeah, no, yeah sorry for this uh, technical issue. Give me a moment, it is uploading. Mm -hmm. So I will gloss over the management of iron overload in patients with uh, thalassemia, because clearly that is well understood by specialists in the field, essentially. But the point I'd like to make is that there are some studies to suggest that chelation, effective chelation, will reverse or stabilize liver fibrosis. So on the one hand, one can reduce the iron content of the liver, and importantly, in the way that iron causes damage to the liver, probably by complex mechanisms, including oxidative stress, effective chelation will reverse or stabilize liver fibrosis. And this was shown in the study published in gastroenterology some years ago. And I think this forms the mainstay of advocating effective chelation, for, uh, starting at appropriate indices in young individuals to try and improve both the necroinflammatory score, the inflammatory changes that are injurious to the liver, as well as, of course, to reduce severe hepatic fibrosis. Here measured as an ISHAC score, stage six being cirrhosis, and you can see that there was considerable improvement as the iron content of the liver was improved. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to give a very brief top-down overview of aspects of cirrhosis, because that's the dreaded complication in patients with thalassemia, as well as patients who have other etiologies of liver disease. These are slides from patients with hepatitis C, but they show the final common pathway of accumulation of hepatic fibrosis, shown by appropriate histochemical staining, until broad bands of fibrous tissue occur isolating liver nodules, giving this um, macro picture of a cirrhotic scarred novel. This is what we would like to prevent because of the morbidity associated with cirrhosis, not least in patients with thalassemia. The natural history of cirrhosis is complicated. We recognize that patients may have histologic cirrhosis at a stage where it is clinically compensated. We can measure the hepatic venous pressure gradient at this point. At this stage, patients do not have portal hypertension. Do they, they do not have esophageal varices, swollen veins in the esophagus. They do not have ascites. This is compensated. And we know that some of the fibrosis that occurs in diseases such as viral hepatitis can be reversed with effective antiviral treatment. Also, there is extensive studies. There are probably at least um, 80 to 90 studies which are examining the possibility of reversing hepatic fibrosis in the cirrhotic liver. What concerns us are the decompensating events where in addition to the histologic stage of the disease and the beginnings of portal hypertension, we start to see bleeding from esophageal varices, the development of ascites, for example, and all of the other dreaded complications of cirrhosis, including hepatorenal failure and susceptibility to the other complications. And that will result in hepatocellular carcinoma. In some individuals, we can see HCC before the onset of cirrhosis, but typically in about 80 to 85 percent of individuals, depending upon the etiology, HCC will occur mostly in patients who have accompanying cirrhosis. This stage is associated with a, an increase when it is measured in the hepatic venous pressure gradient. So the diagnosis of cirrhosis can be clinically suspected in someone with hepatomegaly or splenomegaly because of portal hypertension, and common features of cirrhosis, depending upon the etiology of spider nevi, palm erythema, clubbing, Dupuytren's contracture, muscle cramps, fetal hepaticus, for example. We also rely heavily on biochemical investigations where we can see a change in the ratio of the AST, aminotransferase, to the ALT, an increase in gamma GT, 
an inexorable decline in the serum albumin concentrations and prothrombin time increase. So these are biochemical and more and more we rely on hepatic imaging like ultrasound and in particular transient elastography to identify advanced hepatic fibrosis. These are the complications of cirrhosis. They ensue mainly from portal hypertension with a complex pathogenesis that does involve increased splanchnic blood flow, but peripheral arterial vasodilation and central uh, underfilling collateral formation. And I've oversimplified this, but this circuit of events results in bleeding varices, hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, the hepatorenal syndrome, hyponatremia, hepatopulmonary syndrome, and the high cardiac output, which are the common complications of cirrhosis that we will encounter. This, for example, is a patient with a shrunken nodular fibrotic liver. You can see the liver is small and extensively crenated with this irregular edge. You can see the splenomegaly in this patient. There are some collateral vessels, and you can also see the extensive accumulation of ascites in this patient. I can refer you to a good review of a few years ago published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which refers to a generalist algorithm for the management of cirrhosis. I think most hematologists looking after patients with thalassemia would be involved at this point. If it does become more complicated and one is concerned about management of the portal hypertension, regular surveillance, at this point, Patients with thalassemia and cirrhosis should be referred to a hepatologist for all of the care coordination that is necessary and the appropriate surveillance. And these are the particular measures, however, that the generalist can apply when looking after the patient with thalassemia. I won't have time to go into detail, so I've been very selective in the next few slides. The prognosis of cirrhosis is disturbing. About 47% of patients will develop ascites, 28% encephalopathy, and 25% a GIT bleed within 10 years. These are ominous signs. If varices develop, around 15% of patients with ascites will die one, within one year. These are all marks of decompensated cirrhosis. The annual incidence of liver cancer is around 5%. It does depend upon the setting and etiology. And the median survival, unfortunately, for HCC is very limited and extremely limited if it is advanced when diagnosed. You will recall your anatomy. The portal vein is formed from the interior mesenteric vein and the confluence of the splenic vein to form the portal vein. When the liver is cirrhotic, the inflow of the portal vein is increased. We can measure that inflow by an invasive technique which tells us the hepatic venous pressure gradient. We can see this clinically with hypersplenism, the development of esophageal varices. But it's the managing of cirrhosis and portal hypertension that does require specialist input. To su summarize, and I've oversimplified, in the main, this requires regular imaging of the liver for hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance. We use ultrasound and, if necessary, MRI or CTC scanning. We'd like to do endoscopy every three years because of the risk of esophageal varices, but we can ban these and we can prevent first bleed by using beta blockers, for example, and we can assess the risk by using portal pressure measurements, although this is invasive. The most common complication of cirrhosis, and this would occur in patients with thalassemics with decompensated cirrhosis, is in fact ascites. I won't go into details, but it does relate to that complex splanchnic and peripheral vasodilatation. In the main, we first rely on fluid, fluid restriction. Most patients will respond to diuretics, but these need careful dose adjustment. For larger volumes, we might need large volume paracetas. The risk of ascites is, of course, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is an ominous sign. We need to give albumin when we do large volume parasitesis to avoid complications such as renal shutdown, hepatorenal syndrome. We can consider more invasive shunts like a TIPS or portosystemic shunts to alleviate intractable ascites, and we have to be very careful when managing the diuretics of these patients, that we do not push them into hepatorenal syndrome. 
for some reason I'm losing the screen share and I have no idea why it is, but I'll go back to browsing. Sorry about that. I have no idea what's happening. It's just disappearing. It's okay. Technical issues uh, do appear with these webinars. So, Very strange. Yeah. It's just. Just a minute. I've only a few slides to go, and hopefully we'll get through those without the uh, them disappearing again. Um, So we can use TIPS, which I've shown on the slide, which is an effective shunt for managing patients with extensive ascites. And there are some contrary indications in jaundice patients who have very severe liver disease and who are at risk of encephalopathy because we're shunting the blood effectively around the liver and losing the liver's filtering function. So the last thing I'm going to talk about briefly is hepatocellular carcinoma. We think that the incidence is increasing in transfusion dependent thalassemia. There are a number of excellent reviews from uh, patients uh, and thalassemia specialists, which I've indexed below. Disturbingly, we are also seeing HCC in older non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. The basis for this is not clear, but it seems to relate to iron overload and the effect of uh, erythropoiesis in these patients. Chronic viral, viral hepatitis played an important role, and we think this will play a lessening role as we are lessening the risk of uh, hepatitis and improving treatments, as you will hear. So the potential mechanisms and pathways to liver cancer are shown here. Certainly, it, depending upon the prevalence of hepatitis B or hepatitis C in parts of the world, we will see that the proportion of hepatocellular carcinoma attributable to hepatitis C or to hepatitis B will vary. The diagnosis of primary liver cancer relies on regular surveillance with ultrasound scanning, alpha beta protein measurement, and both should be done. If a, a nodule is seen, we can characterize the nodule by MRI scan or CT scan, but the important aspect of this is regular six-month surveillance in patients at risk. The idea is that with surveillance, we can find small, resectable, ablatable, or even transplantable hepatocellular carcinoma, as shown here, that will fit within the criteria of such treatments and are potentially curative rather than advanced disease, which is silence. There are well-described diagnostic algorithms for hepatocellular carcinoma. These would apply almost equally to patients with thalassemia, although they've not been as well characterized. But I refer you to this recent review in the Larson, which uh, characterizes nodules as small, less than one centimeters, and the necessity to return to regular imaging, and the larger nodules and the subsequent characteristics, including arterial hypervascularization, which help the radiologist to uh, describe this as likely to be hepatocellular carcinoma. So we have well worked out algorithms for HCC and we have quite well worked out treatment algorithms for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. Again, these would be by and large extrapolatable to patients with thalassemia. They depend upon very early stage lesion given a Barcelona classification and much more advanced stage. By surveillance, we shift the numbers of patients we can see who have small tumors and would be potential candidates for resection or ablation, etc. But only if regular surveillance is done can we find potential candidates for such treatments. The um, numbers of patients who have been transplanted for hepatocellular carcinoma and thalassemia is not large. But this number may increase as improved management of the iron overload and cardiac disease becomes apparent. So I would think by and large this Barcelona staging and treatment strategy would apply to patients with thalassemia with the emphasis on early discovery and diagnosis. 
we have some preliminary evidence to suggest that in patients with HCC and thalassemia, survival curves would, as you would expect, differ according to the Barcinoma Clinic liver cancer staging. And for those individuals who have earlier tumor, the survival is far better. We have options for treatment of liver cancer. It does depend upon the stage, as you saw, but by and large, it depends upon resection of the tumor, if this is possible in a, in a patient with cirrhosis. Liver transplantation is curative, and hopefully we will see this option more often exercised in patients with thalassemia. We have options for targeted tumor ablation, image-guided transcatheter tumor therapy, where we can feed a catheter into the feeding artery and actually ablate the tumor. And the number of agents we have available for systemic therapy is expanding every year so that our results are improving. So to summarize my talk, which is this very top-down view of liver disease and thalassemia, improved iron control will improve survival, reduce the iron burden, we think reduces uh, hepatic fibrosis. We don't yet know to what extent this reduces the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, but we hope this would be the case. Screening blood for hepatitis virus is clearly important. You'll hear more about improved treatments for hepatitis B and C. We're improving our management of patients with cirrhosis, but we would like to avoid cirrhosis as far as possible. We need to find tumors if they are present at an early stage with appropriate surveillance. It's not yet clear to what extent appropriate chelation therapy is going to obviate altogether the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. But as with many other diseases that cause cirrhosis, it is better to treat to prevent cirrhosis. Thank you. I think that is my last slide. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, I said thank you very much. Um, this has been uh, very, very informative and very educational. Well, uh, for all of us, because <clears throat> we are very desperately trying to improve our monitoring system, our monitoring protocols, let's say, in the context of the new updates that are coming up in the uh, next month uh, by the end of uh, December this year. And one of the huge problems and questions of our doctors, of our medical uh, treating doctors, was um, what kind of monitoring should we introduce for observing liver disease, for uh, preventing hepatocellular carcinoma, how often, what tools. These were really the questions that have been asked, and it's just that you have provided, I, in my opinion, the right information. But uh, let's hear also um, a medical person on this issue. Uh, and last but not least, this Barcelona liver um, algorithm that may be extrapolated to uh, the uh, monitoring of thalassemia, uh, is a very, very, um, uh, is a very optimistic um, tool that uh, we would ask your help, support, and contribution when we are finalizing and uh, updating um, the chapter on the liver disease, Professor Diego. Thank you so much. Thank Michael. you. Um, there's some questions that, that come up from doctors. Sorry. Later. Later. All right. Okay. So, uh, if we could hear Professor Koskinas, he's on the online. Yeah, we can ask Dr. Dusheko to stop presenting um, please, your uh, yes. presentation. Can we finalize your presentation, uh, Professor Dusheko? Close the. Um... Stop presenting, please. Yeah. I'm just trying to find where my stop presenting thing is. It won't <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm much better with Zoom than Microsoft Teams, but I'm not sharing. I just, how do I stop sharing? Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah. We, we, we were fine, actually. We we're very good. We, we have had considerably uh, larger delays in previous webinars. We, were, we are fine. Thank you so much. Can you stop sharing? Because for some reason, I cannot stop sharing. I, I may uh, rejoin the team meeting. Okay. There we are. Okay. Thank you. There we are. So, Please. Professor Koskinas is on the line. Um, I am, now I'm on the line. I um, have, you, have you been listening to us, uh, Professor Koskinas? Yes, have I have been, been listening to you. Okay. 
Do you so, hear me? First of all, yes, do you hear me? We can yes. see you and hear you very well, and we are delighted and very privileged to have you on board. Thank you. So well, thank you so much. Go ahead with your presentation. Do you want thank me to share up the presentation now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you see my presentation? Yes. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, then. Can we start now? Yes. Or no, right. please go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like um, to thank you all of you, the organizing committee, for your kind invitation to speak in this webinar. It's always a pleasure to discuss these issues with you. And uh, my topic would be viral hepatitis in thalassemia, prevention, eradication and treatment. And this is my conflict of interest. And uh, let some introduction slides. You can see here the geographical distribution of, you are aware, of course, of thalassemia and sickle cell anemia in different parts of the world. And we do have five uh, uh, viruses that attack mainly the liver, and those are the hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis delta virus, hepatitis E virus, and hepatitis C virus. Some of these viruses, may cause, all of them, they may cause acute infection, either symptomatic or asymptomatic, but some of them, namely hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus, can lead to chronic infection. And this is the most common cause of liver cirrhosis and cancer. Uh, I would go through some on these viruses in relation to uh, thalassemia patients. And uh, Professor Duseko very nicely has covered the topic of chronic hepatitis. I just want to tell you uh, that chronic hepatitis may lead to cirrhosis in a substantial number of patients. And those patients with cirrhosis, they may go to decompensation or hepatocellular carcinoma uh, and then to death or transplantation. Uh, I will not go into details uh, because, as I said, Professor Duseko very nicely covered this issue. Uh, but cirrhosis is the uh, changes in the architecture with the diffuse fibrosis. You can see that here, the regenerative nodules, the vascular changes leading to portal hypertension, and the diagnosis of cirrhosis can be either clinically by biopsy, by ultrasound and triplex of the portal vein uh, and uh, the collaterals, and also by fibroscan, as has been nicely said. Now, some that one, I would like to talk about the compensation because uh, I would like to bring you into attention another issue. Patients with cirrhosis, they may go to the compensation with ascites, portal, uh, um, varicella bleeding because of the natural history of the underlying liver disease that should be treated. Uh, but there is another uh, way that you can go to the compensation, let's say the compensation, but it's not really that. It is the acute or chronic liver failure. It means that it's an acute insult. Um, virus, infection, or surgery uh, can really lead to failure, to chronic, to uh, acute liver failure on patients uh, with underlying cirrhosis. Uh, and I, you understand why I'm talking about that. And the issue here is how to prevent or treat the acute cause, rather to prevent it. And you see, the cause of this acute insult is really differs in the East and the West. And the East is mainly acute hepatitis A or hepatitis C e or hepatitis B virus or drugs or hepatotoxins. Uh, instead, in the West, it's mainly the infection, the sepsis or surgery or trauma. So that brings me into why we should be uh, really talk and inform our patients about hepatitis A and hepatitis C, particularly those that they have underlying liver disease uh, in the context of thalassemia, iron, or hepatitis C, liver disease. 
So hepatitis C has a geographic distribution. You can see that in everywhere in the world with high prevalence in some countries. And this is very important. This is uh, its spread, as you probably know, from contaminated food and water. And uh, of course, uh, by uh, uh, sex uh, uh, with someone who has already hepatitis A. It may be asymptomatic, uh, particularly young age, but in old age could be symptomatic and it could be very serious in patients with hepatitis C, hepati uh, diabetes and liver, liver disease, including patients with iron-related liver disease. So we should inform our patients the way that this hepatitis A is spread, is transmitted, so we have to know how we can protect our patients. We should probably be aware to wash the hands, use a hand sanitizer, and of course to prevent hepatitis A by giving them a vaccine. So the vaccine is really a must in patients with underlying chronic liver disease because the acute infection, it could be very severe in some patients, and we have a very uh, uh, good um, vaccine for hepatitis C, and you can see after the first injection, you may have really a protective antibodies in a very high proportion of patients. And after the second dose, after six months, you have almost 100% protective antibodies. And this applies also to patients that they may go to countries where it is endemic. So they have to be very aware of that. Now, hepatitis C in another, is another hepatitis virus uh, that is uh, through contaminated, uh, mainly through contaminated food and water. Uh, you can see here the geographical distribution and the epidemiology of the hepatitis E infection. And we have uh, many genotypes, uh, and we have mainly the genotypes one and two that may uh, transmit from uh, human to human. Uh, this applies usually to areas where is the high endemic uh, for hepatitis E through contaminated food and contaminated water. But in the West, the most likely source of HCV infection is of digestion of uncooked food. is through the pigs, the deer, and the wild bear, and you can see that later on. You see here in the endemic areas is mainly through the contaminated water uh, and foods. And in non-endemic areas in the West, in Europe, is from uncooked pork. And it could be as well be transmitted through transfusion. And we will discuss a little bit about that in relation to patients with thalassemia, which they get a lot of transfusions. You see here the main route of transmission. So what about screening? the blood donors for hepatitis C. Should we do that? Uh, you can see here the uh, HCV RNA, the infection the, in blood, in healthy blood donors. And you can see in areas, how is the frequency to find someone with uh, viremia uh, when is going to donate blood? You can see that in India, in Kashmir, you can see here, and this is HCV RNA. Those patients who are healthy, who are donors, blood donors, they do have actually hepatitis E virus. And you can see in Austria, in Netherlands, uh, what is the, uh, the, uh, the frequency to find someone which is viremic when he's going to donate blood. So it's a geographical, of course, distribution and differences. And you can see here the seroprevalence of antibodies to hepatitis E virus in blood donors. And you can see this uh, variation in different countries and regions within the countries and uh, this uh, seroprevalence uh, increasing with the age. So what should we do probably about the blood donors? Should we screen all of them? You can see here that countries, this is a matter of cost effectiveness and the prevalence of hepatitis C in the country or in the region. And you can see here the nations that have already introduced the screening for hepatitis C, others that they are is under consideration. And you can see in UK that less than 1% of the acute cases of hepatitis C it relates to transfusion, uh, but the rest of them is through uh, digestion of not very well cooked uh, pork or wild beer 
or deer. Um, so in Greece, you do have some preliminary data about the hepatitis E virus. It seems to have been not an issue, and we do have confirmed one only case uh, all these years of acute transmission of hepatitis E uh, in thalassemia patients. So what we should inform our patients with thalassemia? To avoid consumption of uncooked pork, wild boar, and deer, and to cook very well, and very be careful uh, uh, for hand washing uh, and uh, hygiene, high hygiene. Uh, so blood donor screening in thalassemia is really very much dependent on the country and the policy and the prevalence of hepatitis C in the population. Now let's go now to the other two main viruses that may lead to chronicity and are very important. And the first virus is hepatitis B virus, which is not very prevalent in patients with thalassemia. You can see here the uh, uh, geographical uh, distribution and frequency. Uh, they are very endemic areas, you can see here. Uh, and the impact of immigration have really changed very much. Uh, the impact and the prevalence of uh, the incidence of hepatitis B virus in different regions because of the immigration. Uh, from high to low, probably endemic areas. Now, hepatitis B virus, everybody knows, it can be transmitted uh, blood to blood uh, by sexual uh, contact uh, from uh, a carrier mother to infant, from child to town. And for all of this, uh, the answer is vaccine to prevent all these transmissions. Now, not everybody that is uh, infected with hepatitis B goes to chronicity. You see less than 5% of adults, more uh, than 80-70% in infants. And if you go to chronicity, then you may have no liver disease or you may have chronic hepatitis is different. We call chronic infection if you have the hepatitis C virus, if we call it hepatitis, if we have signs of liver damage. Uh, how you can make a decision for treatment for hepatitis B. This should be based on biochemistry, elevation of amino transferases, on viral replication, HBV DNA in serum, the liver damage, and uh, how you assess the fibrosis uh, by fibroscan or by liver biopsy. We use nowadays the fibroscan. Uh, and we use the ultrasound, the triplex, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, <clears throat> confirm if there is or no uh, cirrhosis. If uh, there is other liver disease, should, this should be into account, the age of the patient and the family history of hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, we have of, you, you are aware that we have a short duration treatment with interferon pegylated for one year, um, and we have the long duration, we use usually, uh, we nowadays use more the long duration, the nucleoside analogs. This is the most potent ones, then Tecavir and the Tenofovir, and this is the Tenofovir uh, that uh, really does not excrete it uh, by the uh, uh, kidneys. So you, should, uh, you can use that in patients who have a renal failure. Uh, this is uh, exactly where they act. Um, and what we have now and what are the goals of therapy in hepatitis B, for the moment, we don't have really drugs, novel drugs, to eliminate the virus. It means to get out from the body the circular ccDNA that it is in the hepatocytes of the infected patients. Uh, a functional cure, it would be to lose the hepatitis surface antigen and develop anti HBS antibodies protective, and this is not very, it's, it, it, it can be done. Uh, it's really uh, not very frequent, uh, but it can happen. And we're very happy if this happens because we can stop the treatment. But we usually what we would expect and what really we're comfortable with that is with the nucleoside, uh, nucleotide analogs we have, we uh, suppress the virus so we don't have serum HBV DNA positive, we have serum HBV DNA negative, and we have continuously AST and ALT normal. And this is our goal and our aim, and we can do that with the uh, drugs that we have today in more than 95% of our patients with hepatitis B. We do have 
a preventive uh, measurement uh, measure. We have the vaccine for hepatitis B. It's the first vaccine against tumor, against cancer. Uh, you have heard from Professor Kunduseiko. Three doses, safety, absolutely safe, no side effects, efficacy, tremendous efficacy, no need for booster injection if you uh, have uh, confirmed that you have developed antibodies to hepatitis B virus. Uh, so who is going, everybody probably should get, uh, and the pediatricians, they do that in their, all the children, uh, but uh, we should be aware and we should probably recommend and do and check for that in patients with underlying disease and in our thalassemic patients. And let's move now to hepatitis C virus, which is more prevalent in patients with thalassemia. This virus has been isolated in 1989, and this is very important to remember. That's why I put that in red. Uh, what's the transmission? Unsafe injections, medical procedures, blood to blood, unsafe sex, um, not so easily, of course. Uh, mother to child, not very easily. And the main really source of infection is the uh, injecting uh, drug use with common syringes. The problem is that in uh, some countries, in underdeveloped countries, there are really unsafe medical practices and transfusion because they, you buy your blood donor and you don't check the blood donors. So there are two mil, uh, million uh, new cases because of uh, uh, really unsafe medical procedures in the uh, East. We're not, uh, we're, uh, we don't leave everybody uh, in Europe or in America. Uh, so the prevalence of HIV infection in drug users is very high. You can see that and you can see how it increases in new drug users. Uh, and it is the in developing countries is the injection of drug the most uh, primary cause of new infection hepatitis C. Uh, now in Europe and the EU states, you have really a molecular uh, uh, testing of uh, blood donors. Of course, you have the protective triad, the medical history of the blood donor, the uh, inactivation of the blood and the products, and the screening, not with antibodies, with the window 70 days, uh, that you may not find uh, antibodies and the virus would be there, but with the molecular uh, testing, which really narrows the window uh, to 12 days, and you can see here what the chances with a molecular screening with HIV RNA to get infection, it's really, really very low. And why we, our patients with thalassemia, they do have hepatitis C in up to 80% of them because before 1990, we didn't know about the virus. We didn't have the test. We couldn't really test our blood donors. So we did really have a problem and most of our, or a lot of our patients, they have been contaminated. You see here the prevalence in Europe, in many countries in Europe, uh, in Greece is about 1.52%. You can see here in Eastern uh, uh, Europe countries, they may be a little bit high. This is the different genotypes. Uh, I'm not going to into detail. So what happens if you are uh, infected with hepatitis C, you may get a resolution of the virus. Uh, you don't get immunity. You can get the virus again, but the problem is that you can go to chronicity in a substantial number uh, of patients, they may go to chronicity in 70-80%. How you can diagnose and treat your HIV, you can test your for antibodies. If it is negative, there is no uh, um, uh, infection, uh, there is no e ever a, a infection. If it is positive, you can test for viremia with core antigen in poor countries or with HIV RNA by PCR. If it is positive, you confirm the infection, you check for genotype, to select the treatment, you select, you check for fibrosis because you have to survey, uh, to think of surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma. You have to look uh, uh, of the drugs that the patient takes, if there is any comorbidities. You have to vaccinate your patient for hepatitis B, for hepatitis A, and you have to stop the alcohol consumption. You see here the, that as the time goes by, there are not cardiac complications anymore, or at least they are decreasing for cardiac problems, but they increase the liver disease problems. And you know the iron, the HCV, the fibrosis, all they have been very nicely 
uh, uh, said by Professor Duseiko. Uh, here is the prevalence uh, in, in Greece in different areas from 25% to 63%. Uh, and if you have high iron in your liver, if you are HCV positive, the chances of having uh, fibrosis and cirrhosis is really, you can see that, uh, the worst scenario. And what do we have now for hepatitis C and how we treat our hepatitis C patients? First of all, it's the first time in history, of the in the medical history, that the virus which is causing chronic infection and remains in the body can be eliminated by drug. So today we have therapeutic regimens with high SVR rates. SVR means sustained virological response. It means elimination, clearance of the virus in more than 95, 95%. We have available treatment for all infected patients, at least in Europe and in the States, in most of the countries. And the target is to uh, eliminate the virus and screen and find new patients and treat them all. And we have really very nice and very effective drugs uh, that they attack various uh, sites of the virus replication, you can see here. Uh, I'm not going to into details, but we do have now two, com uh, two uh, combinations of first line pangenotypic. It, it means that they are very effective in all the genotypes from one to six. So we have two combinations for first line for all our genotypes of hepatitis C that we give them for 12 weeks for three months and we do have clearance of the virus in more than 90 percent of the patients and if they fail and it is a small possibility that they may fail to this first line we do have a second line now combination from oral drugs all these drugs are given orally and you see that with a second line combination in those that they have failed in the first line, you have an excellent response and elimination and clearance of the virus. Do we have side effects? The answer is no, we don't have. There is no fatigue, there's no headache. It, in, in, you know, in, in uh, the different studies, you may say that, but in real practice, you don't have any, those that they have the clinical experience with these drugs, you don't have absolutely no uh, side effects with the medications for hepatitis C. Uh, what you should probably do is to check all the drugs that the patient receives and find out if there are possible interactions and there is a website for drug-drug interaction. This is the Liverpool site. You can, you can uh, select your drugs for hepatitis C and you can check with the drugs that the patient receives and you get this nice color. If it is uh, red, it's, it seems, uh, it, it dignifies uh, that you can use or you have uh, to stop the drug that the patient uh, receives. So, there, but in clinical practice, there are rare absolute contraindications. In case of this stop or change the drug the patient takes, it's only for three uh, months. In relative contraindication, you don't do anything. You just follow up the patient regularly. And usually, as I said, there is no problem for the majority of the drugs that patients uh, take. Uh, PPIs is allowed. Uh, uh, with one dose in the morning. And uh, what is very important for our population, for our thalassemic population, there is no drug-drug interaction with the iron chelating drugs. And what's the ambitious global targets that have been set by the WHO in order to control the viral hepatitis by 2030 to reduce the new cases, to uh, increase the treatment uh, of uh, the uh, uh, patients with chronic infection and to reduce the deaths from hepatitis C chronic uh, infection. Um, in this way, we have really performed and applied uh, in the major region of Attica around Athens, uh, where seven centers for thalassemia patients there, uh, there exist. And we have really uh, a program for, micro, for, ch for check and treatment so we can call it this micro-elimination program. We have treated more than 150 patients out of 1,400 with thalassemia. You can see that we have a high prevalence of hepatitis genotype 4. It doesn't mean anything. 
uh, nowadays. No one discontinued treatment because of side effects. No drug drug interactions with iron chelating or anti arrhythmic uh, drugs. And in some patients who had received the new drugs uh, with ribavirin, in the very first days, we used sometimes the ribavirin. Uh, the frequency of transfusions was, in, uh, 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 was increased without major effects. Uh, but nowadays, we don't use any more ribavirin in our combination. So in this population, we have some failures because we have used wrong combinations. Everybody wanted to treat our patients. Every new medication we wanted to give to treat our patients with thalassemia. But some of them, they were not very efficient. Uh, but nowadays, we do have very efficient drug. As I said, uh, ribavirin is not recommended anymore. So those patients that they have failed, uh, treatment of the second line was absolutely successful. And I will end with something that uh, Professor Duseko very much illustrated, uh, and it is very serious in our population. It's the uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, because we see more now patients with hepatocellular carcinoma because they survive long. They don't die from cardiac disease. They may develop now hepatocellular carcinoma as a consequence of chronic liver disease, and this starts very early. Uh, from the infection of the hepatitis C or the iron accumulation. It takes many years. And so even if you treat and clear the virus, you may have the, uh, the possibility to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can see here the experience of our patients with hepatocellular carcinoma in our thalassemic group. This is the age which is younger than you would expect for those patients who have no thalassemia and have chronic liver disease. It is uh, 56, 60 years, 55, it's not 42. You can see that don't, they don't have, uh, they, uh, uh, only 60% have a hepatitis C virus. Of course, all of them, they have been treated with DAEAs, uh, and they didn't have HCV RNA when the, the diagnosis uh, of HCC was made, but it's not in all patients, the hepatitis C, so iron, could be a risk factor, and you can see here a diagnosis, only 35 they have severe hemosiderosis, but who knows, those in the past they may have different, and still the iron, the iron is still there. So how important is the iron chelation therapy in this population? Cirrhosis, now we're not always cirrhotic patients. The majority, yes. The multinodular HCC, uh, the tumor diameter in our patients, uh, I'm not going to take into the details in all the other patients. So in conclusion, uh, viral hepatitis and thalassemia. Uh, we should probably, uh, and very important, to uh, really enforce the systemic iron chelation therapy for this population and have to check the effectiveness with the MRI leak, the uh, iron concentration and the ferritin levels. Now, in terms of the he viral hepatitis, we have to treat every patient with thalassemia and hepatitis C with the new antiviral drugs with no ribavirin to date, very effective, no side effects, short duration. You should treat the chronic hepatitis B infection if necessary, if it is the replication of the virus uh, it, it exists or there is a liver disease. Uh, I'm not going into details. Vaccination for hepatitis B and HIV after serological testing is mandatory. And for hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance, liver ultrasound with or without son of you contrast uh, if there is a lesion uh, or uh, every six months independent. This is my, uh, I think, uh, uh, practice independent of the presence of cirrhosis by an experienced radiologist to check very well the liver. In case of suspecting lesion, they should perform MRI with contrast and measurement of alpha-1 uh, phytoprotein. Inform your patients about the transmission routes for hepatitis virus A and E, and, take the and they may need to take the precautions for prevention and do the uh, vaccination. And of course, very mandatory, uh, this is the government and the country policy that we, we have to really to have a good molecular screening for hepatitis viruses in all our blood donors. So uh, this is my end slides, really. This is more than enough. Uh, 
and I think that you, I wish you to have the best summer holidays ever, of course, in Greece. And thank you so much. <laughs> I think we should invite the audience to ask questions right, and write them for us. So, thank you very much for, us for this uh, wonderful presentation. So, well, thank you very much. I think this is uh, this was an educational bomb for all of us as well, and I think very importantly the the issue of. Um, um, of effective iron chelation and even more importantly effective monitoring of the success of iron chelation is very important and this is where we are lacking in many countries around the world where MRI and LIC are not really measured on accredited uh, kind of tools and that's where we want to and also the uh, monitoring of the ultrasound and the MRI. Thank you so much for this information let us take some of the questions for um, on the part of our healthcare professionals. Uh, Michael, you have any questions? Ah, there we are. Yeah. Can uh, just uh, so you can stop sharing. Um, uh, Professor Koskinas, can you stop uh, sharing? We would like you to continue sharing, but in the context of the webinar, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, questions. did I succeed that to stop? <laughs> yes. Sharing? Very well. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so one question that comes up, uh, of course, all the questions is that the comments are really educational. Thank you very much. Um, monitoring is very important for us. There is a question, and uh, um, how can we um, how can we apply uh, good iron load monitoring so that we can. Um, um, we can get the right information for arranging our algorithms. Of course, this is not a question to you, it's a question to their policy makers. Um, thank you for sharing our expertise. I think you've got a couple of questions, uh, Michael. Um, actually, uh, one question from me, uh, Professor Goskinas, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit puzzled by the fact that 25% of your patients with hepatocellular carcinoma had a normal LIC. Now, is this a normal LIC at the time of diagnosis? And But perhaps it wasn't normal in the past. Perhaps somebody had, uh, their doctor had given them uh, intensive chelation and removed a lot of the iron, but still the, uh, the process leading to carcinoma continued. It, 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 I thought, one expects that it's the patients with the high LIC uh, uh, that, uh, that would develop carcinoma. 25% is quite high. I don't hear you very well. You mean that 25% of our patients who did what? Well, in, in the slide that you showed, you yes. showed the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, 25% yes. of these had a normal liver iron concentration. Yes, at the time of diagnosis by uh, the MRI, but we don't know really in the past how many of those patients that have been treated very well with iron chelating treatments. So yeah. the iron accumulation over the years in the past, it could be, and as I said, the preneoplastic lesions, they start very early, five, ten years before the development, uh, the clinical uh, confirmation of the hepatocellular carcinoma. So who knows that those patients, they have zero iron or mild hemosiderosis from the very beginning. I wouldn't, uh, yeah. believe, so, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe, I wouldn't believe that this is the case. Okay, so I, I guess the lesson for the clinic doctor oh, is really yeah. to ensure low zero, low liver iron as from the duration of the patient's life really um, this, is very, this is very 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 important and we know that very well that even in the absence of cirrhosis the iron accumulation we know that from hemochromatosis from uh, the congenital hemochromatosis, that even in the absence of cirrhosis, you may get hepatocellular carcinoma in the presence of iron. So iron really is very important. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So we have to, 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 to make sure that our patients, they have and remain with very low iron in the liver. Yeah, this is, the, this is a major issue for resource-limited countries, as Professor Dusheko has pointed out, because the monitoring system of iron load is really lacking. Even in countries of Europe, we really don't have a, um, a, a validated LIC due to the fact that, you know, it's, it's an expensive tool. And that is, um, that is a weak point in the chain of monitoring and early treatment. One question from our doctors is that if a person with thalassemia lives with chronic hepatitis B for over 30 years with normal living function tests, should they be treated with drugs for hepatitis B? What is exactly the uh, what is exactly the patient? What's the the, the, the patient the is a the, the character yeah. is they have normal aminotransferases and what else? Yes. Yes, for 30 years, normal aminotransferase, but he's been hepatitis B positive. It doesn't specify uh, HPV, RNA or whatever, but um, normal liver function test, should they be treated with drugs or not? He's been with let's for 30 me, let, years. Let me extrapolate a little bit the data. If they have normal uh, liver enzymes, aminotransferase, uh, you should still check for viral uh, DNA for HBV DNA because in case that those patients they may have cirrhosis and uh, then they should be treated with uh, antivirals. So in the presence of cirrhosis, it doesn't matter if they have normal aminotransferases, you have to treat them. So cirrhosis yes, is an issue in these, in these patients. If they don't have cirrhosis, then you should go to viral replication and I yeah. would uh, I would think that maybe they don't need antiviral treatment. Yes, and I think um, that's what where we should be concentrating in our guidelines. I, you know, I would very kindly ask both of you to contribute to the liver chapter. I think uh, Professor Koskinas already has, and we need to bring in uh, uh, hopefully Professor Dusheko. Uh, one of our board members, Loris, can you ask your questions, please, directly? Oh, yeah. Thank yes, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Thank Lawrence you. Is yeah, Lawrence is a member of our board. Uh, he represents Italy, but he also represents the Board of Thalassemia International Federation. Yes, Lawrence. Thank you to both the speakers for the uh, brilliant uh, presentations and the very informative presentation for the patients. Uh, a very quick uh, couple of questions. The first is we have uh, uh, some clinical trials in place with uh, uh, a new innovative drug called epsidin. And this is uh, for also for uh, probably uh, regulating the uh, hemostasis of iron in the liver. is a protein produced by the liver. Of course, the doctors, the doctors know very well, but I'm, I'm telling that for the patients. And uh, do you think that uh, this drug can be also can help the patients to improve the uh, the iron situation of the liver, avoiding the complication of uh, the iron overload. Uh, and this is the first question. And, and the other question is uh, related to the presentation of Professor Cosinas about the drug drug inter interaction of the uh, new drug of the treatment for hepatitis C. And the question is, in Italy, from, from my experience, uh, from what I know, uh, all across Italy, uh, despite uh, there was no evidence that uh, the treatment uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Kelant agent called the feriprone uh, was uh, uh, interacting with the, with the sofosbuvir and, and the other agents for, uh, for, uh, for the liver. Uh, our doctor used to stop the treatment with the, the feriprone before using the, the, the drug for uh, depleting the, um, the C virus, uh, hepatitis C virus. Uh, do you have the same experience also in Greece or uh, in other countries or uh, it is only uh, an experience from Italy? Thank you. 
thank you for your questions. Uh, first of all, I cannot comment on the data and the results from the hepcidine trials. Uh, I don't know really what will happen with them. That will be an ideal maybe drug uh, to reduce the iron overload in the liver, but uh, our friends hematologists, they will probably uh, know something about that more than I know. Uh, as far as the second question uh, regarding uh, your isolating agent, we didn't really have, in our experience at least, any, any drug-drug interaction. So I can't really comment on something that we haven't experienced. That's, um, that's reasonable, yes. Indeed, we need to have uh, data from the hematologist first, but it's a good question about maybe reasonably contributing. Anything else, Loris, on that? I think these were your questions. No, no, well. thank you. Thank you. I was curious to, to know if they have experience about the use of Epsidin, because it could be very useful also from us, uh, uh, from the regulatory point of view, because, you know, this is uh, in the pipeline, this drug is in the pipeline. And so yeah. it's very useful for the patients who have more information before the drugs come out uh, to, to the market. This is mm -hmm. fine for me. Thank you very much for um, okay, thank you. Um, and, and another major challenge, of course, is the cost of the drugs, because uh, I'm sure you're both uh, the professors and um, are thinking of the European environment or, or the Western environment. And uh, um, even in these countries where we live in, the cost of drugs is, is a huge um, is a huge problem. Although in some of the uh, developing countries. Um, some uh, um, kind of um, generic or um, or um, a, a cheaper a cheaper form of the drug of the of some of the drugs antiviral drugs have been uh, uh, promoted. Um, so cost is um, it is an issue for many countries still. Um, that's um, many of the questions that have that have come up are related to the cost, but of course the professors cannot comment on the cost. Um, um, Michael, you've got another question? Sorry? I was hoping for more questions from the patients. <laughs> All the comments from uh, the doctors and the patients are just uh, uh, thanking for the informative uh, lectures um, and presentations and there are not real any other questions so if there is nothing from George Costandino whom I see on the on the screen and usually <clears throat> um, has some queries do you need to comment or ask any question George uh, George yeah hello yeah, uh, yeah. hello not 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 really I'm uh, the both presentations were very uh, informative and very uh, precise. Uh, the, 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 the big problem still exists for me, which is that we still don't know uh, whether a hepatic carcinoma is only um, interactive with people that had hepatitis C or hepatitis B uh, and lots of iron overload. We know of patients who uh, never had hepatitis B or C, uh, and their liver iron was very low for many, many, many years, uh, but they did eventually have uh, a hepatic carcinoma, uh, and which was fatal. So it's still very much uh, lack of total understanding as far as I'm concerned. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Uh, Professor Dushenko, can you comment on that? That's a good uh, comment. Thank you, George. I think George is right. There, there is an, a group where the hepatocellular carcinoma is not easily attributable to the obvious risk factors like hepatitis B, C, and extensive iron overload. But it may be that um, the amounts of iron in patients with uh, well-controlled iron is still abnormal. It's enough to mm -hmm. set up oxidative stress. The other metabolic factors, the other uh, extraneous factors may still be operating in those patients. I guess it comes down to we don't fully understand the pathogenesis of hepatocellular carcinoma even in hepatitis B or hepatitis C 
We know hepatitis B virus integrates into the human genome, and that's fundamental to oncogenesis, but we don't know a lot more. Same is true for hepatitis C, and this has been well reviewed by several authors. So there are a group of individuals where perhaps fatty liver disease, perhaps other factors, even just a relative increase in the amount of iron, even though the absolute amounts of iron are not very extensive, acting in concert or resulting in HCC. I guess what this means is that it makes it difficult to institute appropriate surveillance for HCC in some individuals, but I would still think that this should be most applied in patients who have advanced fibrosis. I, I, I guess that age may have something to do with it because other forms of carcinoma, other sites uh, are actually increasing also uh, in some thalassemia patients as they age. So there's a possibility that this group of puzzling patients may belong to just uh, an aging process. Age is certainly an important factor. I, I would just make the point that with new hepcidin agonists, for example, there's a long latency between our interventions and sh proving that we're going to reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So if these drugs are successful, the first endpoint of therapies will be, I suppose, their safety and the ability to reduce iron concentrations to show that they reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in the clinical trials will not be possible. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think that um, we may have come to an end of this webinar and um, with your consent, as it has been said from the beginning, um, may I just mention that um, Gadia Belidi, who is watching this webinar, is a scientific educator who has organized this webinar together with Roy um, in the office in the context of the healthcare professional platform. And there will be um, the same um, presentations in, uh, in the context for all of, the, for all of the patients electronic platform and we have kindly asked you to reform these lectures in in the in a, in the language that perhaps it will be more understanding um, to a wide um, audience of patients and um, my very very uh, grave concern I should use is that <clears throat> we cannot or the patients are not under control of their liver iron content or their um, all their um, tools for monitoring liver disease um, across the world. There are huge difficulties in introducing validated MRI uh, softwares or buying the liver iron, liver iron content uh, software from um, Feriscan, for example, which is at the moment the only EMA uh, FDA-approved liver iron content. And in the absence of this uh, very good monitoring and, um, and um, measurement of iron, uh, I'm afraid that um, uh, despite the huge progress of the antiviral drugs in the case of viral hepatitis, all the monitoring and the good surveillance and um, the criteria for early diagnosis and uh, treatment uh, in um, hepatocellular carcinoma maybe a bit a long way in these countries. So this is um, what TIF is fighting for, to see whether first and above all could establish the uh, assessment of the effectiveness of the chelation that the patients receiving all over the world, which is not the same as it is in Greece, as it is in Cyprus, as it is in the UK, and a few other countries, which is only a minority percentage of the global patient population. So with the wish um, that the healthcare systems in the very near future um, will also address genetic diseases and prioritize um, diseases that um, have a great um, medical, public health, social and economic repercussion like thalassemia. Uh, so with this wish, um, TIF will continue to uh, support and um, prepare position papers and update guidelines on a continual basis. 
hoping um, and wishing to be for, for you two to be contributing to our next updated guidelines. So thank you very much. There is one question that Roy will ask you final. Yeah, yeah? From, uh, from Pakistan. From Pakistan comes, uh, where is it? Yeah, few doctors in Pakistan. Few doctors in Pakistan prescribe these medicines to thalassemia. Which yes. medicines? It's antiviral. In a, presume, sea liver. Sea liver. Sea liver. Sea liver. Yeah. Ah, sea what, is, yeah. what is this? Sea Yeah. Yeah. Do they do? The Silimarin, yes. Yeah. Silimarin. They prescribe, yeah, 200 milligrams. They prescribe it for um, their patients, med for their thalassemic patients. It's Thin. said to be liver protective. It's liver protective, but probably it's, um, what is it? Uh, it's a herbal. It's a herbal. Is it effective? Should it uh, be used daily? Patients. I'm not sure if our medical experts can comment on you this. No, they can. There are yeah. many publications. Um, uh, Professor Koskinas? Uh, we do have this antioxidant like vitamin E, silimarin, and other, um, this pro hepatoprotective in brackets, drugs. They may have some effects. They may uh, really decrease the elevated amino transferases in some cases. But definitely they are not removing the iron and definitely they don't remove and kill the virus. Okay. Um, do you have an additional comment, Professor? So in addition to what our Pakistan uh, collaborator gives, it, it must, uh, he must uh, follow guidelines for the medical treatment. I agree. It's, it's not a... Um, I don't think that drugs like psilomorin, which have got very interesting properties, there are several publications, it even has some antiviral effect in hepatitis C, but it's not a first-line drug. I don't think it uh, is known to do any harm, but its benefit is unproven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, George, you, you want to say something? To, uh, in addition to your comments, Andrula, just that uh, even though some countries do have uh, the testing necessary, uh, the MRI and the liver iron, uh, the next thing is for people when they had those tests, uh, for the clinicians to take action, which also doesn't necessarily mean that once they've got the test uh, results that they will actually take any action. So maybe we ought to re-emphasize that doing tests is no good just doing the tests. You've got to then go ahead and take corrective action. Thank you. This is the value, the great value of the expert patient's voice and position. And with this, I think it's the best um, sentence and call to finish. Thank you so much, both of you. And Thank you uh, so we're much. very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You all, Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Stay well. Have stay a nice safe. week home and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Good holidays to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.